So you're on. Oh, okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite our dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Du and uh, her research colleagues. Um, Dr. Du is uh, a, a, assistant dean um, at Rutgers, um, Rutgers Global, and uh, she in and she works as a um, student advisor in the um, School of Arts and Science. Is my introduction correct? You have so many titles. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I first joined Rutgers, I was uh, assistant advising at School of Arts and Science. And after three years working at SES, I switched the position to RU Global. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit more about yourself and then your colleagues? Um, yeah, sure. So thank you so much for inviting me and Lauren to do this presentation. So right now we both work at RU Global Study Abroad Office, but today the presentation is mainly about uh, my dissertation research mm -hmm. while I was at University of Minnesota uh, doing research on the self-authorship learning outcome of study abroad. But we try to integrate the research at that time with the you know, new student testimonies and our work experiences at Rutgers. So I'm Lauren, why don't you get, mm, go ahead. Hi, and my name is Lauren Winogran. Um, I did my undergrad at Ramapo College in North Jersey, and I did my uh, master's level work at Drexel University. And similar to uh, with Fong's presentation, I did my master's work um, in evaluation of uh, student learning outcomes uh, with University of the Arts in Philadelphia. So this was a, a topic that's near and dear and interesting to um, my frame of mind as well. And thank you to Fong for allowing me to join here with this. Yeah, since we have a small audience here, can we take the time to each briefly introduce ourselves and uh, what is your um, you know, involvement with GSE and uh, what will be the information you are interested in taking away from this session? So, mm -hmm. um, I see. Brittany, you want to go first? It looks like you unmuted yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I'm trying to show my face. <laughs> Hi, um, I um like just come into the brown bag so I really didn't read what it was about but I'm seeing that the title is self-authorship and I haven't um uh written anything yet uh by myself so I'm interested in that um but I'm also a um in a PhD student in math education so I think my internet is off but anyway that's it <laughs> thank you Brittany Hi, my name is Danielle Murphy. I'm a learning sciences student at the GSE. I am interested in epistemic cognition and I'm also interested in feminist theories of deconstruction. So I'm interested in your talk because you talk about, um, I think you said reauthoring. So I'm looking at reauthoring um, science content to include the voices of girls. So that's why I'm interested in your thought, in your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol. Um, I uh, currently work for the GSC under the National Institute for Early Education Research, um, but I'm currently pursuing a master's in student affairs. And we just literally learned about um, the self-authorship theory. So um, I was just curious to see what your research will present. Thank you, Carol. Drew. Yeah, so I I'm Drew Jatomer. Um, I'm on the faculty here. I'm also the director of the PhD program and um, coordinator for the Brown, one of the coordinators for the Brown Bag series. So thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really excited, excited that um, uh, DACA uh, recommended you. And, uh, you know, I try to come every week to look at different work that um, can just of interest around the university or around the country. And uh, I'm excited that you're here to contribute, uh, um, you know, what you, the work that you're doing, because I do think it will have, it has real implications for our students as well as faculty. Okay, thank you. And then let's get 
started, I will be sharing my screen about a PPT that Lauren and I have been working. So can you see the slideshow of the PPT now, the cover page? Okay. So self-authorship as a learning outcome of study abroad. And this is just for the brown bag presentation for Graduate School of Education by me and my dear colleague, Lauren. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the context of the study, why we want to connect study abroad, learning outcome with the theoretical framework of self-authorship. This dissertation was done in the year uh, 2005 and 2006. I defended in year 2007. At that time, study abroad is an emerging field of research, but goes through um, an then learning theory and a cognitive learning series of course, beginning to merge with a lot of new neuroscience findings at the same time. After doing some literature review, at that time, it looks like the only link study abroad learning outcome with some a very limited theoretical framework, such as how study abroad will impact uh, your multiculturalism or how study abroad will influence foreign language learning, and how study abroad will influence your identity development. So all those learning outcomes is associated with one singular, singular in my opinion, aspect of a, a young adult's development. And then also people have trouble identifying, at least in the literature field, what indeed in the study abroad learning context, make it such a transformative um, learning environment. People all come back saying, study abroad changed my whole life. I was a transformed person. But then when you really dig deeper asking them, what is so unique about study abroad, different from your lab experiences, different from your service learning, that make it so transformative, and then we just cannot find any definitive work in the literature yet at that time. So we identified this field that is worth exploring. But then, of course, nowadays there are new challenges. So global learning to not only study abroad, but also global learning as a whole. COVID-19 has put severe restrictions on travel and any global learning projects, but at the same time, new projects and new skill sets are required for anyone, no matter you are, um, you know, manager, administrator, or participant of global learning. So I think it's just all the more interesting for us to go back to this global learning in this new context. Then, um, Lauren, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the new context of study? the new context. <laughs> Great, and I was gonna say, I know Fong shared her journey here at Rutgers. I just was gonna share, I've been at the Rutgers Study Abroad Office as a senior program manager for eight years. And so within the, the context of study abroad and international education, uh, the lens uh, through which we have students evaluating their, their uh, growth and uh, uh, values and skills they are learning developing or strengthening when they're abroad um, is something that we're looking at through kind of new contexts as well. And so as the world changes, there continue to be opportunities. And in this idea of self-authorship, which um, Fangdu will talk through a little bit in a moment here, but it, it requires students to collect, interpret, analyze, and reflect from their own experiences. And so we are seeing a bit, and we have been for a few years, even prior to um, this current COVID reality here, um, but the idea of shifting from what's traditionally study abroad towards global learning instead. Um, there's also this idea of internet intersectionality related to diversity, um, racial, racial justice, um, and a variety of intersecting identities of students. And so being able to uh, look at and delve a little bit more deeply into 
learning outcomes from students based on these different um, identities and realities that students uh, walk into these experiences with. Uh, global, local, or what we term uh, within international ed as global learning um, is becoming more formalized. And so in areas within study abroad where we traditionally would see um, a group of uh, US or a group of Rutgers students going overseas to go um, learn about and uh, experience and possibly help out in a service learning um, method about poverty, you know, in another country, you know, being able to uh, formalize and find the pathways and the connections to do so um, here on campus, here within the United States to look at these same issues and be able to have a, um, a lens to, to see global issues through the context of what we're experiencing on a national level or a state level as well, or community level for that matter. Um, also in terms of problem solving, we're seeing um, opportunities and the continued development for uh, students and faculty to explore mo more global problems in terms of uh, within themes of the UN um, SDGs to look to see um, for goals that were supposed to be uh, accomplished or at least um, substantial headway be made to have um, some countries make more progress than others. Again, that's another interesting opportunity uh, as we talk through and think about um, the data that Fung's going to share with us from the last 10, 15 years of online and global learning and virtual study abroad opportunities. Uh, there's also the idea of online learning helping, um, helping students connect to and have access and equity in ways that traditional study abroad and travel abroad would not necessarily um, allow. It gives this idea of developing new forms of global collaboration. And so uh, our office, Rutgers Global Study Abroad, as well as the larger entity of Rutgers Global uh, is constantly looking at new and different ways to collaborate globally. But um, from a student, perspective, um, it's really figuring out what worked yesterday and the day before might not work today and might not work tomorrow. So allowing the uh, framework and the paradigms to evolve so that um, we can keep up with student needs, uh, future jobs and otherwise for the coming um, for the coming future. And then uh, also this idea of expanded opportunities for experiential learning and curriculum reform. And so uh, as Fong talks a little bit more about self authorship, it's an area that we'll revisit at the end of this. So definitely um, think about and ask questions as we go here related to how what was done and what has been traditionally study abroad will continue to expand and uh, change. And the purposes of study, to examine the outcomes of study abroad with a holistic developmental framework, self-authorship. We all know self-authorship not only look at your cognitive development, but also your intrapersonal and interpersonal development um, based on some previous existing work of student development theories. And then to explore the unique learning conditions in the study abroad context, to address the relevance of applicability of self-authorship model in designing and administering study abroad um, programs. And of course, this is, a, you know, I have been an administrator since I got my, before and while and since I got my PhD. So as an administrator, you don't do a lot of theoretical research at all. And action research has been the main areas of research we are doing uh, as you know, someone who is in the front line of working with students and other staff members. I don't know how many of you in the audience uh, will be, you know, research theoretical researchers, faculty members, or how many of you will be working in the front line as teachers or um, 
staff members. So, but no matter who we are, we can always do action research based on our daily work. And our research question, to what extent you got to ask that one research question and have a non hypothesis, of course, for your dissertation. Here it is, to what extent and in what ways does the study abroad experience affect college students' self-authorship development? So we're only studying college, traditional college, uh, age college students, and then the measurement theoretical framework we use will be self-authorship. And then what is about the theory? Um, this is a source there, but according to Baxter Magoda, self-authorship is the capacity to internally define a coherent belief system and identify that coordinates mutual relations with others. In this definition, there are three main dimensions that um, need to be defined. This first dimension is cognitive dimension, also called epistemological dimension, and then interpersonal dimension, and inter means your relationship, how you negotiate your relationship with other people, and then intrapersonal dimension is mainly about how you identify with yourself, and then what is your internal belief system. So only look at the intersecting part of these three dimensions. Only you have successfully negotiated and coordinated these three dimensions can you call yourself uh, reached a certain stage of self-authoring. So we are constantly, you know, deconstructing and reconstructing ourselves, of course. But at certain stages, you can always reach a self-authorship stage. And then there is another layer added to this theoretical framework. It's not only about the three dimensions. Each dimension also has three developmental stages. It's not that you learn something, okay, I'm, I reach self-authorship. The journey can be long and complicated. So basically the three dimensions, uh, the initial stage is called external formulas. And the transitional stage is called crossroads, and the self authorship stage is the eventually the mindset you want to get to, but you can always jump out of it and go back. When you're renegotiating a new self, you can always start from a lower level and go back to a you know to a new stage of your own self development. So for example, um, what let's take one example. Um, on the interpersonal dimension, if you're at the initial level, it's a lack of awareness of your own values and the social identity. When you try to comment yourself, it's how my teachers define me, how my parents define me. And then crossroads, evolving awareness of own values and a sense of identity. You begin to figure out who you really are and then begin to examine yourself through the lenses other people gave you. I have two teenagers at home and the other day one, I was trying to give him a label. Okay, you are, you like music, but you don't like to perform. All of a sudden he began to be super mad at me. Who told you I don't like to perform? <laughs> so I think it's just a perfect example of crossroads and trying to renegotiate at a different level. And then self-authorship level is choose own, choose own values and identity in creating internally generated sense of self that regulates interpretation of experience and choices. So um, eventually, you know, someday, if you finally settle on a career path, you can articulate really well, what is my own personal country dispositions that made me want to be on this uh, career path and what are the external influential factors that contribute to this eventual choice of career path. So, and you feel really comfortable with that career path that we regard it as you have reached the level of self authorship. So, um, I've seen some in the chat box, but 
Not necessarily questions, just talking, but we'll, we'll have, if Brittany's willing to share, we'll talk towards it. Okay. It's kind of, uh, let's just move on through that. At that time, uh, we tried very hard, then it came to methodology and research design. At that time, I looked everywhere. I even contacted the author Baxter Magoda myself and asked them, do you have an instrument to scientifically and quantitatively measure uh, student self-authorship? The answer from her and from a couple of UCLA professors at that time was, no, we're still in the developmental stage of developing an instrument in order to measure self-authorship. And whatever um, research findings you have in a new context will be helpful to contribute to our study. Um, to prepare for this presentation, I did some initial research again. I realized the instrument is still being developed. So for the lack of a qualitative instrument, the research design is a combination of online survey and one-on-one -on -one interviews in academic years 2005 and 2006. And then subjects, undergraduate students who studied abroad during 2004 and 2005. A setting is a small public liberal arts college that I was working at that time. So this is, uh, this is how we came to this research design. And then, of course, since it's a combination of survey and interviews, the, a brief uh, overview of the survey is just the following. So the total number of Midwest U 2004 and 5 study abroad participants is like 156. It's roughly about 15% of the student population. And then 2004 and 5 study participants who were registered as of April 2006, then 90 of them, and then 43 of them responded to my survey. And then this is a very, very um, rough sketch of the results of the survey. Over 70% of the participants reported progressing into a higher stage of self-authorship after studying abroad. Different degrees of growth do exist among the three dimensions, and more students show epistemological development than those reporting interpersonal and the fewest number of students show intrapersonal development. So it looks like students are more easily reflect on their cognitive development after study abroad. And then the next on the line is relationship with other people and the fewest reported on intrapersonal development. Then I had face-to-face -face interview with four of the participants and here today I'm going, only going to report in three of them. Uh, the Midwestern U um, College actually has a very diverse student population. So in my sampling, we try to cover as many um, race and gender as possible. So Megan is a Hmong student senior in college. These are all pseudonames, not students' real names, of course. Victor is Native American, sophomore student, and Mark is a Caucasian as a senior student. So. And then again, this is a brief result of the interview. In terms of learning outcomes, two out of the three subjects they progress towards self-authorship development. So not, only, not everyone reported positive development. Some even reported um, negative development. <laughs> In terms of learning conditions, immersion of local people's lives, initiative, initiatives in designing one's own program and lengthy stay or repeated trips abroad seem to be the factors that contribute the most to positive development. And then I'm going to, the dissertation is very long. It's more than a hundred page. It's a, because it's a qualitative study with a lot of lengthy narratives. So the overall pages of the dissertation is slightly over a hundred pages, but I'm going to, um, you know, report in some brief narratives here. Mark's narratives on intrapersonal development. Again, a very small paragraph. 
I'd say my political and spiritual beliefs are a combination of my experiences abroad. I find that there's so many similarities between religions in the world. So while it goes abroad, instead of finding differences in people's religions, you find more similarities than differences in the world, that my spirituality is just that. It's a non-religious self. I would say religion of the self. You need to focus and through yourself, you can achieve a higher state of being, whether it's enlightenment or meeting God or saving your soul. So he is definitely using the terms of several um, religions, you know, enlightenment or God or soul. So he's definitely using several spiritual terms here. And when I get there, I find that it's a life changing experience no matter where I go. I always learn something about who I am as a person by learning about other people. Pay attention, Mark is a senior student at that time. So relatively, um, I find that I'm a person who is very chaotic in the sense that I don't have a set personality. Of course, you are still very young adult. With every new group of people that I'm working with, I find that my personality changes to best reflect that group. And I think that's why I like studying abroad so well because I fit in with so I can fit in with so many different people and who I am as a person, I like to be challenged. So at that time, I was very moving and touched. I still remember this interview happens, um, you know, in a school cafeteria. I was very challenged on trying to decide which stage of the intrapersonal development is Mark still at. So, um, of course, it's up to a very personal interpretation, but I think at that time I defined him at between the crossroads and self authorship development of who you really are. I think a really mature person is open to any acknowledge that I'm still inventing and reinventing who I am through my experiences, you know. So that's the part that struck me the most of Mark's uh, narratives. And then Megan's narrative on epistemological development. So you're completely depending on other people while you're abroad because you're not in your own comfort zone. You're constantly being challenged to find new things, even during the things you normally do at home, that are new too, because it's a completely new situation maybe. You know, you may be going to a museum in the United States and the exact same exhibit, but if it's in another country, it's a completely different experience. It's whoever you are with, you are there with. It challenges what you are going to do and you know constantly you can be doing your own thing you can travel on your own. So I think Megan definitely um, reported some kind of positive development. Um, in the paragraph before that, he was talking about how at the beginning stage of her journey, she had to constantly rely on a dictionary. And then towards the end of the, she did a long-term study stay. Towards the end of the semester, she was, able to get rid of the dictionary for most of the time and then began to really learn from the context and the local people's interactions and then how even if cooking even if visiting a museum of the same uh, exhibit they still put on new meaning of her learning so and and i think this shows again how the context of learning play a huge it's not just the content of your learning you know, I know a lot of you, some of you in the audience are studying cognitive development. And it has been proven again and again. It's not about the content. It's not just about the content that will be delivered to the students, to the learner. It's more about the context during which the content will be developed, delivered, and the methodology, the pedagogy you use to deliver the same content to the students will have a huge impact on the learning outcome. It's just Megan's narrative is in a study abroad context. And then Victor's narrative on interpersonal development. Please pay attention that Victor is a Native American student, a very, very a minority of the minorities in the US. 
So even at home, he is constantly challenged by his own interpersonal relationship. And then let's see how he feels after he goes abroad. I think when I go study abroad, my peer relationship changes in the sense that I can no longer relate to people coming back. I frequently find friends who are not from this country to be closer to me than anyone else. Um, so when I come back, people just don't understand who I am, but I understand it. And it's changed me a great deal and it's really hard for me to make friends of the same age. And I can't make, it's harder for me to make friends with Americans than just with foreigners, which is perhaps inevitable. But when you are, when you've lived so long overseas, and you travel so much overseas, you become international, you kind of lose a little bit of your national identity, which is hard. We can interpret this data as a negative growth on interpersonal relationship, or you can say it's at a crossroads, at a conflicting stage, but Again, it's up to the interpreter. So if you want to, uh, Lauren, you can take over from here now. So say if anyone has questions or thoughts about uh, what we're talking about, please feel free to throw it in the chat or we'll have some time at the end for you to unmute yourself. Uh, I just was trying to synthesize a little bit about um, the student perspectives that Fang was just sharing with us and just some of the areas that I wanted to point out or share are that the students are spotlighting ideas about compartmentalizing things into familiar or what's comfortable and then foreign ideas or uncomfortable or unfamiliar. And so uh, as students become comfortable with their own voice in general, but also abroad, th these are important concepts to think about because um, the first inclination is to compartmentalize things into what we know and understand, but um, to take yourself out of that and understand that there's going to be areas that you don't have a familiar compartment to, to put this new item in and how you can uh, trust and strengthen your own voice while also kind of wrestling with this idea of new uh, areas of thought or um, exposure to, to new ideas. Um, and then also, a couple students that Fung worked with were talking about trusting their own internal voice, living authentically, and then integrating their internal and external worlds in relation to study abroad, but also their day-to-day -day life. And so um, I think one of, the, one of the participants shared in the chat that they study ab abroad multiple times. Um, and so before I continued on, not to put you on the spot, Brittany here, but um, did you want to share? Do you feel comfortable sharing with the group here? You went on multiple programs. Do you, um, did you find yourself from program one until the third program that you went to trusting your voice any uh, more? You know, were there pieces of uh, culture that you experienced that you brought on and integrated into kind of your own voice and your own worldview um, in your life? I don't know what's going on. It looks like my internet is kind of wonky. Um, hopefully you can hear my voice though. Um, I think it's just interesting to uh, be from, um, you know, a very uh, segregated, you know, city growing up and then go to a very um, segregated, but very white uh, university. Um, and then decide to study abroad and see how different things are and see how um, experiences can be when white isn't the majority. So that was the feeling in uh, Mexico, but then to go to a place like Rome where it is super international and uh, it's not necessarily obvious where you come, fr come from because people didn't assume that I was American right away. So that was a completely different experience. And then go to a place like Prague where um, at the time, this was like almost 20 years ago when I studied abroad in Prague, that uh, people weren't used to uh, seeing that many Africans, period. So then African-Americans were even more confusing and you get stared at all the time and it felt like the circus was in town when I was walking around. Um, I think uh, if anything, it took away like 
the view, I feel like a pretty common American view of um, being like the center of the, uh, the world, you know, um, and just seeing that like uh, things in the US aren't normal you know, aren't the norm. That was one big thing. But then also seeing that whiteness wasn't always, it wasn't the norm either, was also a pretty like strong thing and a, a very powerful thing. And it just made me want to travel more. And then um, like on my own leisurely, and then to uh, just travel to places where, you know, whiteness wasn't the norm became like a big thing for me. So like, um, a few years after studying abroad in Prague, I went to Africa for the first time. And it just was like, oh, like to be in a place where, um, you know, you're, people who look like you are the majority and they aren't all poor or something like that. So that was great too. Hopefully that made sense. I didn't expect this to be the topic and I like it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So if you want to uh, see more graduate students' narratives, we'll have a section specifically called identity development. These are the two links. Um, it, it's just fun to read. So, okay. uh, next yeah. slide, I, Lauren. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, I'll do the next slide. Um, I was gonna just say thank you, Brittany, for sharing. And um, sometimes we get surprised by the topic <laughs> as we come in here. I like it. everything that you just said is resonates with me so much because I studied abroad as an undergrad also, you know, maybe 15 or so years ago here um, in Bangalore, India. And so I went in expecting um, to maybe confront whiteness in a different way. And being in South India, uh, whiteness was still very strongly ingrained within the country. You know, Bollywood stars come from the north and their skin's a lot more fair. And so ideas about uh, racial equity and access came into play in a way that I um, didn't expect, but I was pleasantly surprised about in my learning then. And so it's exciting to see these topics continue to be you know, addressed and reevaluated and looked at too, in terms of our own identity, our own self-authorship, but also um, how all of our uh, universities are now addressing this as well um, to make sure that students are having more authentic experiences and um, what's not necessarily uh, the majority of students uh, used to be the focus and now I think just having student voices be part of that narrative and that book uh, of all of our stories is really important. Um, so kind of making a full circle here about the presentation and talking about self-authorship. Um, I'm bringing back this idea about what our challenges and opportunities are from the beginning. Uh, Fung shared um, great research that I think we'd probably find a lot of similarities. There may be some new and different voices in the mix um, as we do a study here at Rutgers or in other institutions. Um, but it, overall the challenges and opportunities again continue to change each day but um, what did everyone kind of think about the study this idea of self-authorship and where the challenges and opportunities might reside here at Rutgers or within international education or education as a whole um, because I know that uh, there's several um, articles that have been written you know since February, March time with us being home, learning from home, uh, uh, virtual, remote learning, you know, et cetera. These are not new concepts. I did my entire master's degree uh, through Drexel was an online program. So uh, they're not new concepts, but I think um, the education world and the international education world are now having to confront these new realities and decide uh, what what can be an authentic experience, what can um, provide new and different um, access and equity to students having, a, having these experiences. So I'd love to hear some thoughts from those who've joined us. Yep, we'll now open the floor to more discussion. Yeah, so hi, I, I have a question. Um, so first, thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. Um, and so one of the things as, as I was listening to all of this and thinking about 
conversations I've had with young folks who've done study abroad, I, I feel like there are lots of different experiences that people have. Many of them are similar to the kinds of things you share, but there are also experiences where it feels like kind of the uh, American schooling was just moved over to another country and you know, it's some sightseeing or something. And so um, are there features that as you, as people propose programs or as you initiate programs in global, are there sort of key features that you kind of really push on that, that, that will provide the kinds of opportunities that you think are, are formative in the you know, ways you discussed? Yeah, um, you know, our global study abroad is constantly thinking about new initiatives and new themes in our programming. Right now, Access the World is a new theme, so we try to promote those students who are, um, you know, kind of who really cannot afford to study abroad, try to give them scholarship and recommend affordable programs so that they can have the experiences. We're also having the curriculum integration initiative going on, try to merge the study abroad content of learning with to just have the curriculum more integrated. You know, if you're engineering study abroad, we recommend you to a foreign part university that is more have curriculum articulation with our own school of engineering at Rutgers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's definitely on the, and then we also had some really good workshops. Last semester, I think we have Black Muslims Abroad. We have a workshop called Black Muslims Abroad, try to study the intersections um, of multiple identities. When you take things as a norm in the United States, and then suddenly you go, ahead, you go abroad into a different setting, how those norms will be challenged and you'll be presented a new lens of observing not only yourself but as other people as well so really we're trying to provide programming there's so much going on while you're abroad now when you come back it took a little while for things to sink in for you to reflect or want to provide opportunities for people to speak up after you reflect and maybe rick lee uh, our colleague another colleague at our global can contribute more Thank you. Um, hi, Fang. Hi, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm, I apologize if I'm late, but Fang, that was a really great presentation. Um, I do have a question um, about Victor and why you identified his uh, narrative as negative. Um, I really like the, your, your, your differentiation, uh, your uh, theorization between content and context. So if you use that framework, I was also wondering to find out whether or not you could comment more about Victor specifically, his identity as a Native American and his sense of belonging or lack of belonging within the US, how that gets transferred when he goes outside of the US context and how, you know, when he says that he feels much more kinship when he's outside of the US, how much of that hinges on his sense of belonging or lack of belonging within the US and how that um, uh, would then increase when he comes back to the US where it's magnified. And, and, and so the, the lack of uh, perhaps the possible lack of belonging that he initially felt would then be heightened after he has sensed that outside of the US, he is able to connect with different kinds of people. Um, so I just wanted to find out from you like how a person's sense of belonging shapes the, if, they, if that's the content of their identity how that fits into the different contexts in which they're positioned when they're studying abroad or living abroad. Um, thank you, it's a really complicated. Yeah, I like Britney's a lot of, I find a lot of people's reflection like Britney's really so intricate and so multi-layered. I almost feel my interpretation, of course, will reflect my own bias and my own personal experiences. I don't want to, um, you know, to overinterpret, but anyone in the audience, you know, if you have, um, let me share another screen, which no. is part of the raw data. I, th I think, Fang, you're right. I think Brittany's um, own sharing really um, mm. highlighted some of those, mm. those, those, um, the, the complicated ways that when we enter a different kind of context. My issue is like, why would you call that sort of a negative? 
Um, no, I'm not. I say I think you can call it negative, or you can say he is in a transitional stage, going out of his own original belief and in a crossroads. So, you know, growing pains, or let's call it growing pain. <laughs> Rather than call it negative, let's call it growing pain of his own interpersonal relationship. But I can share a little bit of the raw data. Actually, you know, I go back to all my PC files. This is Victor's um, overall narratives. I think he studied abroad twice. One is in Kiev. Uh, studied history and the culture. And then he also did a July in Paris. I hope you can all see this. Um, I don't know how much you can see the small fonts in the Excel sheet, but that's Victor's self-authorship. So he studied in Kiev about history and the culture, and he studied in July in Paris as a linguistic excursion. And of course, you know, the beautiful part of self-authorship is you always study one dimension in the relationship of another. Like Victor is going through some growing pain in his interpersonal relationship, but how about his interpersonal relationship? You know, uh, liberal, he's talking about liberalism in Western Europe, and he think Americans are relatively conservative to Europeans. So that might give you some tradition, additional length. Um, we're a little prudish compared to Europeans and I was able to open myself up at first. When I first met there, this was years ago during high school and I quite a bit more conservative are really American ideas. Even though a lot of those ideas are still in me, they've just been added upon so I can understand them in a better light. So, you know, his interpersonal relationship definitely gets mingled with his own understanding of itself, you know. And maybe in the US, he didn't realize he is conservative in his own definition, but when he went abroad, he said, oh, prudish, he even used the word prudish. <laughs> yep. And then um, I want to um, throw a question back to you that, you know, to the people I know you all even professor, you know, Drew Dacke and Brittany and Daniel, you all have your own research ideas and research interests. So no matter you use self-authorship or not in your next research project, will you incorporate some kind of um, diversity context into your research? If it's math cognition, uh, do you want to study in the US, New Jersey context, or you want to study in the Iceland or Singapore context, or, you know, whoever, no matter you want to adopt um, self-authorship or multiculturalism, multicultural learning context, et cetera, et cetera. Any ideas there? Or let me put it another way. How do you see the potential of today's presentation applied to your next project? <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking like, um, cause I, I'm doing research on mathematics learning disabilities and uh, like the understanding of like what is a learning disability is very different um, in different cultures. And also like the criteria for identifying like what, what kind of criteria you use to be considered as with learning disabilities is also um, different <coughs> in different cultures and also like different uh, understanding like cultural perspective, uh, social construct perspective of like learning disabilities. So yeah, I agree. Like um, I am, I'm have, I have been very interested in like different cultures, different uh, identity. I mean, uh, and the relation um, of like learning disabilities, how they are uh, influenced by culture and different regions. So you, you, you may give me some advice, like how can I better improve my research on that? You know, one of the things, I, I just taught a course on introduction, introduction education 
And um, one of the things that was, I thought, really um, fascinating is we had students from a number of different countries, including, I say, three students who were living in China right now who were on the uh, calls, um, a number of others who were you know, fairly recent immigrants from other countries. And when we talked about issues in American education, because that's really what we were talking about, um, their perspectives and voices were just really, really interesting. Um, and they were uh, certain things that, you know, maybe we assumed were not uh, assumed. They were critical of certain things in American education. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, on, on a lots of different dimensions. Um, but uh, anyway, so I think there's a lot to learn even without the travel, as yeah. long as we have folks from other cultures um, really talking about these issues and bringing those perspectives. So they can bring those perspectives here as well as us. Do we have another one in the audience that want to contribute? Did I see another hand raised? A minute ago. Well, Fung, I was going to say if if nobody is talking, or maybe I'll go in between. But um, Drew, that's a a good point that you're making here because um, within Rutgers Global, we we've met these last few months and kind of really developed this idea of G cell, which is similar to the the concept of uh, coil but figuring out ways to get global experiences and global conversations into uh, the Rutgers classroom without travel necessarily being a part of that um, experience, but it brings in voices and perspectives from other parts of the world that might not be part of somebody's, um, their personal, but as you're talking about US education, it's so often um, the approach of classrooms to uh, detail what's working, what's not in the US system without having it make that connection to international education and what's working or not, um, what's being tried and, and um, elsewhere in the world and, and how that's impacting our own classrooms. So I mentioned the idea of online learning uh, not being a new concept here, it's not, you know, but how is that conversation evolving? And um, again, you know, my perspective is one within the US, but I uh, worked and traveled abroad while I was doing classes. And so I was able to add an extra layer to my education and what I was learning um, and researching because I was able to get some hands-on knowledge outside of the US too at the same time. And I also had people in uh, my program from all over the world as well. So being able to add those extra lenses. And so it, it complicates our classrooms, I think, to um, have so many different ideas to be able to tackle, uh, to tackle. But in what we're talking about in this chat, it's, it's complicated, but it's beautiful because it opens up kind of new pathways for us to um, explore and understand how other people are uh, approaching different topic, education, but climate change, you know, and beyond. Um, so in so many different areas. So I don't remember if the person who had said that they were working on kind of math or statistics. I'm so curious to see how you incorporate this idea of um, qualitative research into something that's so structured like math, um, where it's necessary in that conversation too, I think. Um, but I, I would understand the urge to want to go towards quantitative when you're publishing or, or doing math research. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, yeah, Dr. and Drew, thank you for sharing. I just put in the chat the a new initiative from RU Global, which is GCEL Global Collaborative Education Lab. Uh, it's our office, RU Global's mission, and Rick is actually another very senior level director at Ari Global <laughs> that organize uh, faculty work. So it's our uh, mission of Ari Global to help the departments and the schools to promote this kind of more sophisticated and more in-depth um, 
global learning, no matter for your research or for your teaching and learning. So uh, feel free just to, uh, yeah, again, this is before COVID. So we, I regularly have lunch with faculty members, but now we can also have a Zoom lunch call just mm -hmm. to discuss <laughs> how these ideas, um, how we can use the resources and records to help each other advancing our different missions for teaching and learning. Yeah. Okay, I think we were just about at wrap up time. Um, unless anyone has any really quick comments. <laughs> yeah, Brittany, great. I am just so happy to see that how incorporated into my um, math identities of black children, you know, Interesting, I just had this conversation. I have two teenage Asian boys at home. Just like a week ago, we are having this conversation of how um, my, my older one is attending a really diverse high school. And then we're trying to interpret how an Asian male is negotiating his mass identity with another um, African-American peer from his classroom about his mass identity, the different kind of and at the same time, he's interested in playing basketball, <laughs> trying to identify his young boy basketball identity with the same boy about his basketball identity. So these are the interest. I think how you identify your identity, normally in math learning or basketball playing, will inevitably, inevitably impact your learning outcome in terms of the content or skills. This is a firm belief or a assumption or now hypothesis, I can articulate here and I'll be more than happy to chat with you, Brittany, or um, just to brainstorm with ideas, so. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for um, presenting for us. Um, I have a feeling you'll be uh, forming some relationships here with some of our <laughs> participants going forward. Um, Drew, did you want to say anything else? Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting and exciting. So, yeah. And congratulations on the good and important work you're doing. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Dak to um, be the first one to extend the offer to me. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Colleen and Drew and Daniel and uh, Brittany uh, to be inviting me and Lauren. Uh, it's just our pleasure to have this kind of discussion. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and have a happy holiday, everyone. Yeah, you enjoy the first snow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take happy care. Holidays, everyone, take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.